Hello, it's Simon here. So this is the first part of the recording that I sat down with Round Round We Go to discuss the branding, design, architecture of London transport in the 1920s and 30s and the sort of preceding decades as well. Um, this recording ended up being two and a half hours long and really uh, it's all I think it's all really good and so I wanted to bring as much of it as I could to you to help both um, not give you enormously long episodes to listen to and also to help me while editing so I don't have to edit so much. It's coming to you in two chunks. So this week you're getting the first bit which is mostly on the Victorian and Edwardian eras and architecture and then next week you'll get the second part of this which will be mostly on branding and design and that sort of lovely stuff. So thank you for listening and now on with the show. And welcome back to Rails to Nowhere. My name is, as always, Simon. And joining me today, I don't have Ella. I've got two very special guests. I've got Emily and Paul from Round All Round We Go. Hello, welcome to the show. Hello, excited to be here. Yes, very excited. We've been plotting, planning, thinking about this for, I want to say, six, seven months now at this point. And we finally managed to put it together. Um, but as you'll guess by the fact Ella's not here, getting all four of our schedules to line up was just impossible. So we mm -hmm. um, gave up on that idea. <laughs> yeah, I think we start we we thought about this idea when I realized that the podcast I was listening to was actually you, who I had met, and then we started talking about how we could do some joint episode. But it's yeah, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, tube enthusiasts who make uh, podcasts. Not a very big circle, really. So, what are we here to talk about today? Well, we are discussing the evolution of the branding of London Transport and um, London Underground in this period. This is very much a history of the UERL and the LPTB's branding more than any of the other organisations. Although we will reference the Metropolitan Line and other routes in this because they do have a part to play, but most of the lineage really comes through the UERL. Um, and this is a topic I want to talk about because really, if you talk about London to people around the world, they will think of the Roundel and the Red Bus and phone boxes and all of those sort of things. And a big part of that image is London Underground. London is really one of those sort of few cities where its sort of world identity is defined by its metro system, really. Um, others, I think, you agree, would be like New York and Tokyo, where the metro is sort of big in people's minds, but very much in London. And weirdly, unusually, the logo of the underground is a big part of the city's idea. Um, and a lot of that sort of comes from this period in the sort of 1920s and 30s that me and Ella have been talking about previously and a lot of the legacy of how Transport for London today thinks about its identity and what it does with that find a very clear origin with, um, well, Frank Pick, who we were talking about in our previous bonus episode, who really sets the ball rolling on the um, corporate identity that London Underground would develop um, throughout this period and hold on to, despite several ownership changes and changes in leadership over the last 100 years. Well, not quite 100, 90 years, well, 110 years now, really, 115 years now, really, since some of these corporate identity aspects started to emerge in the late 1900s, early, late 1900s? <laughs> yes, they started in 1994. If you mean 1900s as the decade between 1900 and 1910, though. I think that's where I was is, going, yes. yeah. Because it was basically I 1908 to about... 1912 that all of this first popped up Kicks it. Yeah, i mean if we yeah. want to be very modern about it we'd say the late 19 aughts but i think that's oh, 
or the late the nineteen noughties. No, it's no, too much. No, no, I don't no, like no, it. No. Um, although I have got a reference here on the script of how it um, is part, how it does lead to the development of the current corporate identity in the late nineteen hundreds in terms of the nineteen nineties, because the colours and styles designed and thought up in this period do define. For example, the new livery that London Underground adopts in the late 80s, early 90s. I can't remember when the current red, white and blue livery quite comes in that we now know on underground trains. That is obviously inspired by the red, white and blue of the roundel and the clean lines and all of that's inspired by the same sort of thinking um, that comes out in the 1910s. So if we zip back to that point, 100 and 10 years ago, 115-ish years ago, and go even further back into the previous century, into the 1800s, and just sort of think about how railways were branding themselves and advertising themselves to the public in the Victorian era, which is really an era before corporate identity as we know it today exists. But there's still company identity, organisations still want people to know who they are and be able to identify their names, although, as we all know, you end up with insane names that no one can remember. I know it's Edwardian, but, for example, we have the Piccadilly, Great Northern Piccadilly, Piccadilly and, and Brompton, Brompton yeah. Railway. I know that's Edwardian, but it's Victorian of origin, and, again, the City and South London Railway, like, all these big, long names. I think there's also this element you see in advertising, you know, you see those pictures of tube stations with like 25 different, you can yeah. go to these destinations, there's no demarcation between them, they sometimes make the, like, Waterloo bigger or something like that, because that's yes. the place that they want to be more interesting, the destination they know will come to more people, but it's just... You just look, they just look overwhelming to look at all those names listed on the top of a station when people probably couldn't even afford glasses and couldn't see it properly. It just, yeah, it doesn't And they use multiple names for the same line sometimes. Like there's some adverts saying the Highgate and Hampstead tube for the Charing Cross, Houston and Hampstead, just to add extra levels of confusion. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking what Emily's saying. I'm thinking of two images. One's of the older entrance inside Houston station that just has all the stations you could go on what is now the northern line listed on it and also there's one i can't think what station it is but it's a main line station that i've seen a picture of where it's got like a 20 foot high billboard on the front yeah. that just says a lot of the inner suburban of ones places yeah well yeah. like that the the city in south london euston entrance was the same it had the huge billboards over the top and they listed all the prices as well so it's like here's all yeah. the stations you can get to for one penny and here's all of them you can get for two penny and yeah it's basically everything you'd now find on like six layers of going through an app and making choices just on one giant screen you're basically yeah. reading the source code for a, a modern app on those bu- billboards yeah. and of course all of these signs are the handwritten or hand painted hand created um the sign writing is all done by hand so they are a wonderful eclectic mix of design and style and typeface on the same sign because depending on who's done it and what mood they're in they've selected a slightly different font for slightly different things and so you've got a very cluttered world and then on top of that, you've got all the advertising for stuff that's not the railway. Because <laughs> I always love it when someone whinges about all the adverts you see on the railways nowadays and how terrible it is and it's getting in the way. And I'm like, you have never seen a picture of a Victorian railway station, have oh, you? Yeah. Because... Every single square inch <laughs> of space covered in adverts yeah. for every possible product under the sun. I want to say it's a picture of King's Cross, but it's one of those sort of mainline stations with a big roof and there's a picture of it with like adverts floor to bottom of the glass roof all the way up and it's just yeah if you're complaining that there's too much advertising now well the victorians loved advertising even more than we do now so we're not going to talk about that big advert screen at euston that everybody's (laughs) kicking off about let's not go there no or the uh or the the big ball at uh, stratford But yeah, so the railway companies are putting lots and lots of stuff out themselves. They've got to compete with all the other adverts that they're putting on their stations because they're bringing in money and they're profit-driven organisations in this period. And so 
The railways are, to an extent, one of the organisations where company identity and corporate identity really starts to emerge in the Victorian era because they're serving multiple places, multiple markets, and they want to be recognisable. And they're competing, certainly in some areas, they're competing across the same areas and they want to gain a little bit of identity. And one of the big ways they do this is through simple things such as paint, because it's very easy to paint all of the woodwork in your stations, for example, in the same sort of colours. We all sort of, if we think about the Great Western Railway, those who know about it will sort of think about that brown and creamy colour paintwork that they use, or the Southern Railway uses Yes, the great the South West, the Southern Railway is 1920s when much of this is much more established. But again, it's it's using the livery of the stations with the green paint, and again the livery of the trains. Um, a lot of carriages weren't painted, but those that were would be in a standard livery. Thinking of the plum and cream, I want to say livery of the LNW. Plum and spilt milk. Plum and spilt milk. That's the name. Thank you. Um, but also the locomotives are a really good platform for putting a nice big bold colour on. Again, you've got the green of the Great Western locomotives. You've got um, the maroon of um, later Metropolitan Railway locomotives. And so again, it's a sort of putting your identity on it and then also sort of having a acronym that's nice and easy to put on your locomotives. Is that sort of the origin of logos, really, for railway companies? So we have the London, Brighton and South Coast becomes the LBSCR. We Later on, we have the LNER, which we again have LNER, GWR, as logos on various organisations now. And some of them had slogans as well, like yes. the London Northwestern called itself the Premier Line. And yeah. they were trying they had that early idea of, you know, something beyond just the initials to define yeah. themselves. Something yeah, something snappy that you could put consistently on adverts and, and so we're sort of through the Victorian era we're seeing the emergences of this idea that actually a company wants to have an idea and we're seeing outside of the railway other brands that we still know and recognise today beginning to emerge. So big famous ones would be things like Roundtree and Cadbury, which begin to establish themselves in this period. And this is the point where Cadbury begins. Again, it's harder when you don't have colour printing in the newspapers and, and all of that sort of stuff. But this is where Cadbury begins to adopt purple as a colour that it's identified with. And you're sort of starting to find organisations I think it's the mix of sort of organisations that are becoming national as well and want that sort of recognition wherever they are and a market that is moving around as well because if you've travelled from Birmingham to London but you see a recognisable Cadbury's product in a shop, you go, oh yes, I know that's the product I like even though it's no longer where I'm from. Whereas in the past, before the mobility of the railways especially... (laughs) the likelihood you would be doing much shopping outside of your local butchers or whatever to recognise, to need that brand identity is also minimised. I guess it's the same I, consistency that led to the need for railway time being standardised yeah, everywhere, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, essentially. I think a good example of that, which is so associated with the railways, and I know was kind of, we might be getting into this in a second, but inspiring sort of Frank Pick and, and standardization is WH Smith. Yes. Because they were a very long-standing brand that started appearing in so many railway stations, and that recognition became really, really important. And I think yeah. it's tied up in the spread of supermarkets which i get into with the cadbury thing that sort of we have this consistent brand paul and i have been searching for a long time for a shot of the street outside our house from history that doesn't contain the same boots we don't know when it (laughs) got there but it's been there for all of time as far as we're concerned but it has that branding and it's so consistent and it seemed that's really what i think particularly the underground group started picking up on and tapping into It's Simon. Sorry for the brief interruption to the show. First of all, a really big thank you for listening. It means a huge amount to me and Ella that so many people enjoy listening to our ramblings about railway and transport history. And we really enjoy that we're able to bring this information and research to so many people. 
If you'd like to help us to spread the message even further and to help us to make Rails to Nowhere even better, then you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. You can support us for as little as £2 per month. And in doing so, we send you some thanks, such as early access to all of our episodes, some extra bonus episodes, of which you'll have heard some snippets here on the free feed. And we send you some periodic written updates about how the podcast is progressing. So thank you for listening. Thank you especially to our patrons for supporting the creation of Rails to Nowhere. We couldn't do this without any of you, regardless of whether you're paying us or not. This podcast would be nothing without listeners. It means a huge amount to both of us. Thank you very much. And now I'll let you get back to listening to the show. Yeah, so as we move into the 1900s, the companies that will come together to form the underground are really beginning to sort of move towards this idea that they want to be a little bit more branded, they want to have an identity, they want to create a sense of who they are. But before we pivot too far away from the Victorian era, I would like to just take a quick look at the architecture of the railways as it emerged during this period as well, because the design of stations and the image that they give is also an important part of this story, and we will touch on that later, and I want to set the bed for that conversation just now while we're still in the Victorian era. So alongside the sort of advertising and uh, corporate image and logo thing that we were just talking about, architecture also sort of follows a similar path from slightly chaotic Victorian beginnings and undirected I think is probably the better word because very early underground and railway systems don't really hire an architect to design stations indeed the kind of the discipline of architecture doesn't really exist at the beginning of the Victorian era as we'd understand it today Whenever we do an episode on a Met station, you should see the lengths we go to to try to find an architect, and we very, very rarely do. Yeah, and that's because, actually, from what I can tell, very rarely there is an architect, as we'd understand it today. Yes, we've got, we can think of older architects like Nash and stuff who've des- done grand buildings, and if you're doing a grand building, you would often have an architect. But yeah, for, for the more... grand termini, Euston, St Pancras, they yeah. definitely had prominent architects. But yes, the, the smaller stations... For your run-of-the-mill station, it's usually the chief yeah. engineer just building you something functional. Most of the stations on the uh, beginning of the Met... As far as I can tell, they're accredited to John Fowler, who's just the yes. engineer of the line, and they reflect that to an extent. They're fairly functional. If you look at the original, original bit of Baker Street, which I th- I think it's fair to say is probably the best preserved original Met Line platforms, um, so what is now the Circle Line platforms, they're fairly functional, straightforward. There's nothing. Yeah, there's no elaboration there. They are no. just the bare brickwork, arched recesses, yeah. light wells. It's essentially just the tunnel, but bigger, to allow for the platform space, really. And the surface buildings also reflect that. There's very few, none, of the original Met buildings. Um, Great Portland Street, I think. No, Great it's Portland still Street is a 1930s rebuild. No, yeah, oh, there's a rebuild okay. on Great Portland Street. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't think... It, does Edgware Road have any of its original... Oh. Mm. No, no, oh, actually, no. the Paddington building. The building on the Circle Line in Paddington, is that not the original? Because oh, it looks like the one at the original one at Baker Street. Be, yes. Yeah. Because Great Portland Street's main building is a Clark rebuild. And Farringdon is obviously not the original because that wasn't the original site of the station. Yeah, so we get this sort of haphazard. They're all being designed by our, uh, uh, an engineer and the buildings are reasonably straightforward and simple. And you see that a lot with very early railway stations. Even, as we say, the Grand Termini that are designed by an architect even some of the early ones tend to be quite um simple and fairly straightforward if with, i'm thinking specifically of king's cross and um, paddington's a little bit more ornate but again it's still quite a sort of some walls with a roof over the top and yes brunel had a bit more decoration put on it but it's still quite functional we're not quite in the era of um, St Pancras or Liverpool Street, which have much more sort of architectural flair on them of slightly later stations. And even with those, there was, I think, a segregation between the architects designing the building, often with a hotel incorporated yeah. at the front, and then the train shed at the back, which was definitely the domain of the engineers. You can see that with St Pancras very clearly, even if it's a beautiful train shed. But yeah, so 
As we go through into the 1900s, though, we begin to get a sense that actually we want to use the station as a form of branding. And we see an, uh, I, I think we see an early aspect of this with the CSLR. But again, their stations are quite sort of engineer led. The dome roofs on a few of them are a distinct symbol, though. Yeah, which is an interesting aspect of where the engineering leads to a nice distinctive feature because that's there for the, the lift machinery, but it lends itself to a nice architectural feature that can be used as an uh, identifying feature and then we get the central london railway which uses stations consistently designed by um harry harry bell measures harry bell measures thank you my favorite children's tv program um Designed consistently by Harry Bell measures in a consistent style across all but one of the original stations using orange, orangey terracotta. Um, yeah, terracotta. I mean, Bell measures built stations are so nondescript, though. Yeah. They're so dull. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that I feel like if anyone, you know, people aren't going to ever identify those no. with anything. They're just another building on the road. So, yes, yeah. I agree with you totally, the consistency thing, but it isn't that distinction that you start to get. Yeah, it's not a successful. They would have blended in with a bank or a post office or something like that yeah. of the same era, wouldn't it's... they? When you're paying, yeah, when you're paying attention, you know it's a CSLR. Not CSLR, CLR station. But yeah, it's not necessarily successful as standing out. But what we do see is the next person to come along and design underground stations with terracotta very successfully designs a building that stands out and to this day is recognisable to many as an underground station. And this is, of course, Leslie Green, who comes along this time with glazed terracotta um, tiles in a oxblood red, which is... Unlike Harry Bell Measures' stations, a very distinctive colour on a streetscape. And he also has electric lighting put outside the station, lights it up and makes it stand out in an era of gas lighting. And they really stamp the identity of the organisation as well. You get the name of the route put in nice bold letters across the top. You've got Piccadilly Tube, Bakerloo Tube, whatever... I uh, know initially it's Piccadilly Railway or whatever, but they very no, quickly. No, it's initially, it no, it's initially tube and then oh, it's it the other way around. Ashfield to yeah. change it. Yeah, it was when Ashfields, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a few moments, had the standardisation with the London Traffic Conference on it being oh, yes, yes, underground. Yes, yes. That he went and had tube chiselled off all of them and RLY squeezed into the gap instead, which leads to some really awkward spacing where you can see tube would have fitted nicely and RLY is oh, too God, short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's why you have RLY now. I'm, why I'm going mad and forgetting my my histories. Um, this is why I have other people on the podcast to remind me where I deviate from things. Um, and yes, you've got the bold colours and the contemporary design, and you've got the arts and crafts style. So again, it's sort of modern, modernish, sort of fashionable designs of the time saying we are part of this era and using the electricity again to light the stations and be like we are part of the modern era so it's again a sort of statement about who the organization is and how they want people to see them what i find really fascinating with those is that today we revere the leslie green stations And if you look at the newspaper reports at the time, they were really well received. But there was definitely a period in the middle where they were loathed. If you look at Mm. Barman's book, uh, The Autobiography of Frank Pick, he says the designers of the old underground stations in central London had developed a type of station made up of a big row of arches. Their architecture today seems singularly unattractive. They are pompous in manner. Their colour, the colour of ox liver, about the most unattractive ever used on the streets of London, looks almost black when lit up by the street lamps at night. So there's... He 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 disliked them so much, he was utterly scathing. Which makes sense with the... um wanton destruction that Frank Pick wrought on several Leslie Green design stations, I think it's fair to say. If we're thinking Piccadilly Circus and Knightsbridge and so on, where he just comes in and commissions complete replacement of the the existing station um, and loss of a lot of the original features. 
But also from a perspective of how Frank Pick saw stations, which is also in that Barman biography, he wanted them to be a commercial space. Yes. This was, we want a big open space where people come in, they can immediately pay, they can get into the ticket, they can get into the station yeah. very easily. And that description that Paul just read really sums up how yes. he felt that these Leslie Green stations were very oppressive and small and didn't have that kind of open floor that you would have started to see in, in department stores and things like that that were becoming so popular at the time. Yeah. And in that regard, he's absolutely right, because you go to somewhere like um, Lambeth uh, or Holloway Road or whatever, and the ticket hall is small and tight. And especially now that there are ticket barriers and stuff in it, it's it's a really tight space to navigate rather than, say, for example, at somewhere like Arnos Grove or Sudbury Town, where there's a big open space for you to sort of move around in. So, yeah, so if we move through to the 1920s, um, we see the UERL begin to establish itself with a new station design, moving away from Leslie Green's designs. There are a tiny handful of stations designed by Stanley Heaps in a green style. So thinking of places like... Maida Vale. Maida Vale, thank you. I was going to say Kilburn, and I'm like, no, that's an no, actual Kil Leslie Green. It is Green. Kilburn. Yeah. Kilburn no. Park is designed by I'm him. Thinking, I'm getting Kilburn and Kentish Town mixed up. <laughs> yeah. Kilburn Park is designed by him. And actually, in that Barman book, it's one of the examples that he feels like is more of a sort of that pick feels like is more of a commercial sort of station mm -hmm. kilburn park is a wonderful station oh, yeah. it's one of my absolute favorites incredibly beautiful interestingly in that book it calls it kilburn and i was very confused because i was like that was on the met you didn't even own the met yet yeah but anyway it's it, he was talking about kilburn park and that's that i think at least in that barman biography is picked up as kind of a spark of what could we do yes. from here to make yeah. these stations more open and and commercial really yeah um, and wolford east which i maintain is a um a heap station i know it's fictitious i maintain that's a heap station rather than a leslie green station because yeah. it's on the district line and yes. therefore in yes. my fictitious looking at that yeah. i would assume it's it's a uh, heaps copying leslie green directly for the district line yes. having taken over from harry wharton ford not harry wharton yeah harry wharton ford um, yes um ch uh, Heaps was a BBC soap opera consultant in his later <laughs> life, as we all know. Um, yeah, because so you get those sort of transitional stations that are Leslie Green-esque from the outside because they're still in the, the terracotta, but they are actually much more akin internally to what we'll get on the Morden and the Edgware extensions of the Northern Line, um, where we get Ho 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 Hoden. What pronunciation is that? <laughs> Where we get Holden um, and Heaps on the... So Heaps does a lot on the Edgware extension and Holden does most or all of the stations on the Morden extension. I can't remember. Um, yeah, because he basically yeah. developed a replicable design. Yeah, because I think it's that thing that, that it's probable that Heaps did like the tiling and stuff downstairs, but Holden does all the buildings, if I'm remembering my tube history correctly probably. the downstairs tiling is a whole controversial thing because yeah. people keep attributing it to holden or to heaps but i've also read that it was basically the engineering department who came up with that that kind of black green cre yeah. uh, white tiling pattern that you get on the stations of that era i think that was a holdover of the engineers doing it could well, elements yeah, of the design that makes sense um because there is i'm trying to remember which book it is but it's whichever it is talks in detail about gantz hill where it's got the moscow metro style yeah. design and saying that actually that was an early example of the architect being really heavily involved with every detail of the styling of the platforms of an underground station and the tiling down there rather than just letting the engineers do that bit mm. that's interesting um that would make sense yeah okay. and obviously leslie green was involved in that but maybe that's sort of a gap yes. in that yes yeah. i think yeah, yeah. leslie green unexpectedly did the tiling because we haven't even talked about leslie green's no we're going to talk about we're going to we? talk that yeah, later that comes that, later that comes yes. under leslie green's, and station leslie names. green's downstairs tiling sounds like an <laughs> ultimate innuendo but <laughs> um so yeah so we get 
the new station design developing in the sort of 1920s with the Edgware and the modern extensions of the Northern Lines with both Heaps and Holden doing differing styles. And I think it's fair to say that Pick is much more um, interested in what Holden is doing than what Heaps does. Um, I've seen quite a few things where Pick is a little bit scathing about some of the stuff that um, Heaps designs, which is a shame because I think Heaps is actually uh, does some nice stations. But it's the Holden designer station that really gets taken forward. And this is where we begin seeing a real integration properly of company identity into the station design as well. We'll talk a little bit more about the development of the logo and Johnston typeface and all of that slightly later, but if you look at one of the modern extension stations, you get the round door glazed into the front of the station, for example. You get the design, uh, the corporate image, actually as part of the architecture um, for the station. So we're really seeing the integration of the identity of the station and we're seeing the station being used again as an example of how the railway is keeping up with the modern taste and the modern trend because we're getting Art Deco or move on from Art Deco and more into modernism actually with a lot of um, what Holden's designing. Yes there's some Art Deco flourishes but a lot of it is sort of moving towards modernism although I know it's hard to split those two apart sometimes i mean are any of them truly art deco if you think of art deco being mm. the full-on chrysler building style with the chrome and the really quite elaborate designs i think they were all more of a kind of simple yeah modern with classical elements and then yes. they went to full-on modernist in the 1930s with the sudbury box evolutions yes yeah but i, I mean, can't think of any that are proper elaborate no. art deco i would say 55 Broadway is Art Deco yes. as a building. Yes. But so, it's, not a, it's not a tube yeah. station. So, yeah. it's, I mean, it's no. on top of a tube station. but And even then, it's quite a restrained Art Deco. Oh, yeah, it is definitely restrained Art Deco, but I would describe that as Art Deco. But I'm not an art or architecture historian. No. It would just be, as a passing person, I would describe it as such. My understanding of these two, of Art Deco versus modernism, is very much based on an hour and a half I spent on Wikipedia and reading one book on the two to try and work out what the difference is. And as far as I can tell, my understanding is that modernism, which is really what Pitt Holden's working with, is, as you say, restrained Art Deco moving towards what we would recognise in the post-war era as brutalism. And it's really complicated by Art Deco being a retrospective term that wasn't come up yeah. until the 1970s anyway. So, yeah, how do you how do you decide what fits with something that they didn't no thought yes. or existed as a term for 40 more years 50 more years <laughs> yeah we're yeah we're doing that classic historian thing of going oh yes they fit in inside this label except they don't because they didn't understand that label exists and they weren't operating within it um and you mentioned it just a moment ago emily but yeah in 1929 we get 55 broadway which at the time is london's tallest building and this is designed as the new headquarters for the underground group at the time and is very much a statement of intent, of wealth, of the nature of the organisation. They are big, they're here to stay, and they are modern and of the time and building a building that is at the cutting edge of building construction at the time, really. Skyscrapers are brand new structures. Yes, there aren't any yet in London, really. But 55 Broadway is the closest we get for a couple of years. Then Holden designs um, Senate House shortly after, which becomes uh, the next tallest building or be overtakes and becomes the tallest building in London. Um, and in fact, at the time is so tall that they can't occupy the top few floors of it because the fire brigade won't let them because you can't occupy higher than the fire brigade's tallest ladder at the time. Fun fact. That's a fun fact. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah, the top few floors of Broadway were empty for quite a long time. Yeah. And yeah. Um and it's at, and that's why you don't get skyscrapers in London until the seventies or eighties, because it's only really post the sec I want to say it's post the Second World War that the rules about not being able to occupy a building taller than the height of the fire brigade's ladders are with revoked as part of the sort of desire to rebuild the city, and that's when you get the explosion of sixties tower blocks and things. Ken Livingston was a huge fan of skyscrapers, so it would make sense if you once you get into the GLC era that yeah. that they start building 
way more of them and change those rules. And so, yeah, so we're seeing the examples that the LPTB, or not the LPTB, the UERL at this point, and then later the LPTB are wanting to be seen to be a modern organisation embracing the modern designs of architecture, the modern clean lines. And you've got Piccadilly Circus at the same sort yeah. of era as well as the really great example of a very modern tube station. Yes. Prior to the 30s evolution of that, where you've yeah. got you know, all of the and, marble. And the adoption and... of the escalator and all of that sort of stuff within the station. Again, we're coming back to stuff we've talked before about with the sort of adoption of new technologies that um, bring it into the modern era and, and say, yes, we're progressing, we're making technological innovations because that's what the Victorians loved and it's what the Edwardians loved and it's what people through to the 1920s and 30s. As around the same time, we're also seeing the Metropolitan Railway establishing its corporate identity. Um, so they are, again, rethinking some of their principal stations and their designs. They've got, um, I've forgotten his first name, Clark. What's Clark's first name? Harry, Harry. Harry W. Clark. They're all Harry. I don't know They're all Harry. Harry Walter Clark. Oh, that's no, no, it's Charles, isn't it? It's Charles, no, it's Charles w. Clark. Clark. Charles W. Yeah, Clark. yeah, it's Charles W. Clark. Sorry, I was like, is there a different Clark we're talking no, about? I was thinking of no. Harry Wharton Ford, but it's not. It's Charles W. Clark. Yes. They're all men with three names. <laughs> yeah. Says Paul Burkett Gray. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. at least I'm not Paul B. Gray. It's it's. But you are Paul Harry Burkett Gray, <laughs> so you've true. got the the Harry in there. <laughs> Yeah, so that we're seeing the Met beginning to move away from its sort of more traditional design stations and beginning to adopt, again, adopting more Art Deco, what we'd classically call Art Deco design than um, the UERL are, because the Metropolitan has that slightly... How do I phrase this? Um, it wants to be a main line. It doesn't want to be a modern metro in quite the same way as the UERL does. And it has Identity that... crisis. That's how yeah. we usually phrase yeah. it. Traditionalist. That's the word I was looking for. Traditionalist aspect of it as well. But yes, identity crisis. <laughs> it wants to both be a mainline railway and a metro railway all at once. But they're sort of being a little more conservative with their design. If you look at Charles... W. Clark's designs, they are a little bit more, they're a little closer to your sort of traditional design of station than your um, your Holden concrete designs. We've got um, glazed um, Portland stone in a lot of cases. Is it glazed? No, it's glazed white terracotta. Yeah. So again, it's terracotta and it's glazed white terracotta in this case, um, often facing Portland stone. That's where I'm getting confused. Whereas Holden, where he uses like Portland stone, he's just using it as bare blocks. And for examples of that, we're talking about uh, Wilsdon Green, for example, or as we talked about earlier, um, Great Portland Street Station. Those are good examples of the sort of design that um, Clark is coming up with in this era. I think it's quite interesting that Clark, you know, he did Baker Street as their big flagship, but he also was basically seen as horribly dated by mm. that point because there was the Chilton Court restaurant, which opened in, was it 1929? And within a year, it had to close because the catering contractors were saying, nobody wants to dine here. It looks too fusty and old fashioned. And they had to spend thousands of pounds on redoing it to a more modern style. Yeah, which makes sense because, as we say, like they've, they've got their identity crisis. They're, beat, they're, they're trying to be a traditional railway. They desperately want to be a mainline railway. That's the identity they want. They kind of want to have. But as you say, it's not what the public wants. They strike me as very conservative compared to anything that the underground group is doing yeah. at the time in terms of innovative and innovating and changing. It's just Yeah. Yeah. They just don't want to they don't want to adapt. Yeah, look at Stanmore Station from you know yeah. nineteen thirty two and compare that with the Piccadilly Line stations yeah. that were being built previously. Because that's also a Clark design, and this is the other thing that they get Clark to do two different designs. You've got the city station, so things like Wilsdon Green, which are your big um, t white terracotta station, and then you've got your country station, things like Stanmore, things like um, Watford. I nearly said Wembley Park, that's a complete rebuild in the 1940s. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But, um, actually, the front of Wembley Park is an older design, is an even older design, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's some weird different bits at Wembley Park from different generations. Um, but yeah, Watford and Stanmore are the sort of countryside design. And again, it's the Met trying to be that town to country railway. You've got the cottage style stations in the countryside and the city scene stations in the city. But they're all quite traditionalist, quite sort of conservative, old fashioned. And 
that's kind of, I think, why the Met identity sort of dies in 1933 when the LPTB comes along. Like, obviously, those buildings still exist, but the LPTB does not continue metropolitan railway designs of stations being built after it takes over, which is partially because it's taking over. I know there are sometimes differences of opinion on this, but my view very much is the LPTB is just the UERL taking over the Metropolitan Railway. Anyone who's listening oh, to this podcast... Yeah, they just <laughs> subsumed it. <laughs> know that. Um, so part of that is just that it's Pick and Ashfield taking over the Met and going, well, why would we carry on with what they've been doing? We don't like them. Um, they've won, so to speak. So that ends the first part of these two episodes. Thank you to Emily and Paul for joining me for these episodes and for talking to me for nearly three hours on the topic of branding and design. Uh, Just a reminder that on the 30th of January, we're going to be, uh, so me and Ella are going to be going on a live um, roundtable discussion with History Indoors. You can book your free ticket to watch that online at Ticket Taylor. The link will be in the description, or if you're listening to this after the 30th of January 2024, I'll have updated the link to be a link to the YouTube replay so you can watch it anyway. But if you'd like to come and listen to it free um, live, then please do have your cues ready for an A at the end as well, because there'll be a small Q&A as well. Otherwise, thank you for listening, and I'll see you or speak to you next week when me, Emily and Paul return for part two of this episode. This episode of Rails to Nowhere was presented by me, Simon Sarson Co., and featured the voices of guests Emily Turner and Paul Beckett Gray. Rails to Nowhere is produced by me and Eleanor Ashton, and is brought to you by our fantastic patrons over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to bring you this fantastic content, then you can do so for as little as £2 per month over at Patreon. You can also join as a free member now, and you'll get emailed when we have updates and various Um, episode releases so if you want to keep tabs on us that way rather than through the ever closing world of twitter um, or our instagram then you can do so as well in the meantime you can also find us as rails to nowhere over on twitter and instagram where we post a variety of updates on the podcast's progress anyway thank you for listening and we'll speak to you next time going on random tangents which is going to end up for a lot of editing for you but it's fine it's the question is how much do i edit out and how much do i just make this a two-hour ramble Um. (laughs) that's what we did with jeff as well